let's talk about bad people. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Simon. I'm very excited to have you guys here for the podcast. In today's video, we're gonna explore bad people versus good people or just people in general. Before we jump into that, usually I have a tea, but today I'm actually just drinking some water out of my new Sailor Moon little cup. Look how cute, look how cute. And if you know anything about anime or Sailor Moon in general, obviously, you know, good and evil is the conversation we're all having when we're exploring these stories. So a few things came to mind to, to explore this with you. A few questions from Discord, a few questions in my comment sections, and then a few little knowledgeable nuggets that my patrons shared with me. I have one-on-one -on -one calls with people. P.S. Sign up for a one-on-one -on -one call. I'd love to start booking you for January. In these one-on-one -on -one calls, we do a lot of things. Some of us watch anime together. Some of us get stoned together. Some of us discuss philosophy, politics. Some of us talk about crisis, mental health, LGBT issues. There's a lot that goes into these conversations, but it's always predicated on the person in front of me. All my calls, all my my callers. I like them to sort of guide how the call is going to go based off of where they're at. I like to meet people where they are. And sometimes I talk to unsavory people. Not often, very rarely. And on a very rare occasion, I have to block people. But what I've learned through the years of talking to humans is that we're diverse, awesome, complex, but very simple. Our desires, our needs are simple, right? To love, to be loved, to be seen, to see. It's like we want to feel human connection. I think COVID this quarantine taught all of us that we need people and water. Don't forget to drink your water. But we need that socialization, that comfort of other people's company. Recently, a patron made, a, uh, made me aware of the play um, No Exit. I think that's No Exit. Is that what it's called? Yes, No Exit. It is actually by an existential uh, philosopher uh, who's French. What is his name? Jean-Paul Satir is his name. He wrote this play about three people stuck in an internal sort of purgatory hell. And that's where that saying, hell is other people, comes from. And I've really been thinking about this. Hell is other people. Yesterday, I finished the series on HBO, Scenes from a Marriage, not the original, the remake. And I... At the end of it, called my sister and said, ooh, humans are really challenging me today, boo. I really feel upset at these characters and also really happy that I could see this conversation take place because it's private and intimate. In the play, No Exit, there is this idea that it's a private conversation behind a door, an idea that these, the information that's shared amongst these three people is only shared amongst these three people. And much like the show Scenes from a Marriage, and I'm not going to give away any spoilers, there are moments where you think, oh, if this was seen by people, if this was heard by people, oh my gosh, if people, oh, this feels so real, but I'm afraid to even say out loud that I've had these conversations with former partners. It's very uncomfortable to know that behind a closed door, we could be having authentic, real, really uncomfortable conversations that if anyone heard it, they would just dub us bad or good. Because the context of why that conversation is even taking place, I think, is lost. And it's lost in our black and white thinking, which is why on this channel, the levels is something we use as a tool, an observational tool in language that I created with my co-author to explore a person's introspection level. Remember, we're not judging people's IQ. That's silly. We're not judging people on their ethnicity or race or orientation. We're not judging people on anything other than where are you on the introspection level and how deep down the rabbit hole of introspection are you willing to go before you literally can't anymore? I think a lot of it, a lot of people who can't anymore is because the introspection will pop a reality bubble that you have maintained as objective. What is a good person? What is a bad person is often so complex because it is so fucking subjective, right? It is so on a spectrum and yet we're trying to narrow it down to gays are bad, trans are bad, these are bad, that's bad, he's bad, she's bad, they're bad. Off of characteristics are often things that don't even hold real value, right? In my opinion. So I guess to have this conversation, we have to agree from creator to, co to consumer that in this moment of time, in this bubble, we can pretend that this YouTube video is a closed room. We are behind a door. No one is supposed to hear or, or have this conversation with us unless they have already either watched my channel before and understand we're not coming from a negative place or understand that in general, most humans are coming from a good place. So you guys know I very much believe that most humans are good slash well-intentioned. And I think the people who are deliberately, maliciously, cruelly bad 
are very, very few and far bet- in between. But I think there's enough of them to create so much havoc that it feels like the whole world is this way. And then on top of that, regular good people take what bad people do and put it onto good people who are doing similar things and amplify it to be worse than it is. I'll give you an example. A while back, I had made a video. It's probably private now, to be honest. But it was a video of Epstein and Donald Trump leering at women at a party, checking them out as people with sex drives or sexual desire do. I know people can be asexual, gray sexual. Check out a video I did with Evie Lupine on my channel about the dating and flirting um, layers of dating when you're gray asexual. It's very cool, but we learned that allosexual people, people with regular, like or not regular, I think that's sort of a condescending word, but sex drives like mine, you know, I'm a horny ass person. Like, I don't know how to actually say it in a, in, a, in a more ladylike way. But the truth is, is that everybody I see who's not related to me and not a child is literally like, what do I want to have sex with them? I know they're 85, but like, would I want to? That person's 18. Is that too young? That is super young. That feels creepy, right? Like, we'll have conversa- I'll have conversations with my mind. I will have conversations with my consciousness in which I am debating the moral and ethical quandaries around social interaction with a person based off their age it's not even their knowledge it's based off of the assumption around their age so if if you know my work you know that I have very strong uh, value systems that I keep for myself to keep myself in check but I do not expect other people to have that value system which means we are not going to agree on what's bad or good So we need to agree right here in this moment that there is no objective concept of good or bad. And we're going to have to really be okay with that for the sake of this conversation. And of course, if you're new to my channel, I am not trying to say that you and your beliefs are wrong. I just need you to really examine the self to know that your beliefs are beliefs and what we know is what we know, but not everyone will know the same things or believe the same things. And the way America specifically, because I am an American, specifically the way we have conversations around these things is polarized and labeled and ridiculous. Have you guys seen the recent drama with Hassan uh, saying cracker? (laughs) Yeah, I know. It hurts your feelings most likely, okay? And sometimes it can be misappropriated or misused, but ultimately it's not the same as a hateful bigoted slur that's the whole point hateful bigoted slurs without historic or contemporary oppression are just meanie bobini words okay they're making you feel bad i think internally there's a conflict where should we ban cracker should we not i think i'm more white than you what do you think i I just i think i'm white like i'm super white you know i but i guess white people don't consider me white like and which doesn't consider me white i personally thought i was white so you're white i i i guess i'm white in the same way like if you ask the white supremacist they would say no you're not white i mean well if redneck's not an damn what do you think should we do this like in its own vacuum Hmm. or should we say well the n-word is obviously s-tier slur redneck is one that has been adopted by southerners they use it regularly on themselves i I'm feel a redneck. like yeah how do you know you're a redneck yeah <laughs> I, well I, i'm gonna put it up you say f i'm gonna put it at d we're gonna compromise a little bit okay red i mean i would not be offended by you calling a redneck at all i like, love i all. love rednecks all right so. So let's put it to f fish belly I don't know what this is. A fish belly? You want to give us some intel on this, Ian? This was a Dan submission, actually. Is Ian Ian and Dan our white whispers? I guess. Yeah. Is it? Do people... We need a white person. Yeah. We need like a... Sam or Ian. And not like us. Not like us. We need like a... Ian, you put... You did... Ian, tell us what this shit means. (laughs) Well, you know what hillbilly means. It's a hillbilly. Yeah. Yeah, No, no, I know. But like, I I need to judge the severity of this by like staring at the face of a wasp man who is... Like, this is this is it. You know what I mean? This a hot ass mess. You guys know I believe like all words are good words, all trips are good trips, all things are good things because even though they're bad, they teach you something about life. It's a very anime-esque belief system. I think life is suffering, which is a very philosophy concept. And I do, I do think most of us do get better over time. Even as a species, if you look at the overall way we're going, uh, we are doing better. And I think that's really good. I think we focus on the news and focus on Twitter and focus on our subgroups and subcultures and we forget that just because it's bad for us doesn't mean it's bad for everyone or just because it's bad for some people doesn't mean it's bad for everybody and everyone has to go through their moments of suffering right you would argue that my life is better than my parents who grew up in Iraq under Saddam and you could argue that my life is harder than my parents because I'm queer and they weren't there are a lot of ways you can 
decide someone's having a harder or tougher or better life. And there's also ways you can decide if someone's good or bad through that process. Do you remember the time when everyone on Twitter was saying to unfriend your racist grandma? And I just sat there like, you privileged motherfuckers. If you think you can go home to your grandmas and grandpas and uncles and aunties and just tell them, I'm not going to talk to you anymore, like, please. That's not how life works when you come from a huge family like mine or the fact that you're Middle Eastern or Catholic. You don't just ditch your family because you disagree on politics. You ditch your family because you disagree on what's true. Now, this is not the same thing, but people would say it is. People would say, no, 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 I'm disagreeing with my grandma because I don't think it's true that abortion is killing a baby and she does. And I would say, based off the abortion video I just made a few days ago or a few weeks ago, that it's a human life in progress. It is a living organism. And whether or not you think killing a plant or a baby is the same thing, it's ending a life. And when we end a life, we should be aware of the impact we have it has on ourselves, actually. There is a theory religious communities have that abortions cause conflict in marriages, that when two consenting adults kill their baby together and then maintain or try to maintain a healthy relationship it's hard to because they're so self-aware that they ended a life together and I think there's probably some truth to that I don't think many women with the exception of our favorite I love abortion woman I, feel I, like abortion. With them. I think most people would agree that when they have abortions it is somewhat traumatic on a spectrum I know for myself I've only ever taken plan b as a precautionary measure because I was very loosey-goosey in my 20s but I learned eventually how to get an IUD and I highly recommend them not the copper one it put me on my ass two weeks out of the month but I really like the marina is that what it's called the middle one it's so good it's great I love it I live for it I want to say all of this to say that obviously and we've had this conversation before in this channel there's just no way for me to decide if Hassan's a bad person because he says cracker or if this person's a bad person because they say the n-word or this person's a bad person because they say the f-word or this word or this word or this word it doesn't really tell me a lot about a person based off of the language they use depending on the context. So obviously, I raise an eyebrow when certain people interact with certain people a certain way, and then I want to get to know their character to see where it's coming from. I actually kind of have this idea that in order for us to avoid knowing, or not avoid, but avoid, well, in order for us to socialize in a way that can make it safe for people not to be dubbed bad right away, we would have to allow sort of a acknowledged public space um, criteria of socialization which wow that was a really fucking jumbled sentence to basically say we need to have things in place that's culturally acceptable in public spaces so we know how to publicly judge a stranger or we can say that we shouldn't have that and we should just be a very free society but uh, again a more free society is a more chaotic society which I'm for but a lot of people don't want to handle they would rather have things be less chaotic so therefore more restrictive and again i I don't know if the right and the left in America know they are both fighting for the same bullshit. Like you are both fighting for safer communities by having stronger rules on those communities. Now you described yourself as a traditionalist as opposed to a liberal Muslim. Yes, yes. And, and we were talking a little bit about Mustafa Akul. And so why for you is the tr traditionalism particularly important? And why, why should that carry more weight than let's say attempts to hypothetically liberalize Islam? What is it doing for you? Look, we have, and this is, goes back to the pragmatism point and the postmodernism point. Islam gives you moral anchorage in and of itself. Mm. We believe Islam itself has an inbuilt flexibility, but objectively, it's an, from a correspondence theory perspective, it's an outside truth, which is, which is hard, which is strong, and which can oppose and destroy postmodernism and nihilism. And, and that's what I think a lot of your followers want. They, so you think that a traditionalist grounding is, is a more, it's a firmer foundation as far as you're concerned? When a liberal decides that they want to fuse Islamic ideas with uh, Islamic ideas, with uh, liberal ideas, they're, assu they're, they're almost... Um, they're okay. almost... Okay, fair enough. I can admitting. understand that. And it's partly why I have some sympathy for conservative for the conservative no, perspective. Just, just one, but, one point. Yeah, okay, yes, yes. Point. So they are, they are admitting that there's a, it's almost an admission that this Islam is not complete and it's not perfect. We believe Islam is complete and it's perfect in its guidance. And we believe we have evidence for that. Whether it's the prophets... Yeah, well, okay. But there's, yeah. two, there's two problems I have with that, I would yeah. say. I mean, look, and I, I'm taking your point seriously. And I understand the utility of firm foundations as a bulwark against chaos. Okay. Yes, of course. So, but but here's, here's two problems I have with that. It's not easy to protect yourself if you're a traditionalist against the temptation towards an authoritarian interpretation. 
and flawed as we all are, you know, when we approach, let's say, sacred texts, we also have to remember that it's us who are reading them. And divine though they may be, that doesn't mean we're perfect in our receipt, receipt of their message. And so it's hard. What the, the danger on the, on the more traditionalist side is the slide into authoritarian, authoritarian certainty, as opposed to the slide into chaos on the more liberal side. The Republicans want to put all your dads in prison for weed, and all the liberals or leftists want to uh, fire you from your jobs for not getting vaccines. It's like, okay, prisons, not having a livelihood, it's all the same. If you take away a person's ability to exist and have free will and, and to thrive within that community on predicated on that free will, then you really run into the same issue as I feel trapped in my life and I want to kill myself. I think we really forget that suicide comes from a place of mental illness, panic, uh, abuse, feeling ostracized, loneliness. It could be so many things. For me personally, because we all have personal experiences with suicide, mine came from knowing I was a queer kid at a young age. That's where my therapist thinks the borderline came from. Like knowing at eight years old, I was going to have to kill myself basically or go to hell or whatever it was because I knew how my family felt about LGBT people. So I internalized that as a child and took it throughout my life. And I had different points in my life where I felt safe identifying as a white person. And now I feel less safe identifying as a white person because obviously white has a racist connotation now versus Middle Eastern has a more protected a connotation for my leftist groups, which I primarily hang out in, I'm center left, you know, politically speaking, versus my center right people might hate me because I'm, you know what I'm saying? It's so layered, but it's all predicated on everyone not knowing each other or how to judge each other. I was in Texas and Houston during the hurricanes a couple years ago. There for my brother and I was at the store and there was a woman in like a full on burqa, like full on just eyes showing. And I was like, oh, that is so interesting. And I, you know, as a woman who gets naked on the Internet, I definitely don't fall into that bubble of modesty, but I also am not against it. I just think it's a little silly because I don't believe in God. But who's to say that someone is silly because they do believe in God? Probably just me in the privacy of my home or on this YouTube channel where it's a moment of time behind a closed door. And I can tell you right now that honestly, I think religion is probably going to be evolutionarily out. Like I think eventually so societies will evolve to a point, socially speaking, where they will disregard religion as a logical premise and bring in spirituality as the next religious movement. I myself am a non-God believer, but I'm open to like spirituality and exploration. But it's when you take it seriously that it becomes an issue, which is why the astrologers and the Wiccans and all these people are all fun and games until they start becoming the power and throwing people in jail because you don't worship the devil. Now, I know not literally people aren't really worshiping the devil, but please stay with me here, right? We're being a little condescending and a little jokey, okay? So in this conversation, what I'm trying to figure out in my own noggin here is if we want to throw the word good and bad around, can we do that objectively? And I don't think so. So yesterday in the Discord, another reason this came up was yesterday in the Discord, people were talking about uh, red flags. Are they objective or subjective? Some people think of red flags as an objective, warn other people this is a red flag about a person. I think it's more subjective. Like I think it's a red flag when I'm talking to a person and they um, literally don't know what the word triggered means. So it's not just like, oh, they say it as a joke because I say triggered as a joke all the time. I usually specify medically triggered, like I'm being medically triggered right now because there's no other way for me to explain to people like if I'm having a borderline moment, which I'm over two years clean now. October was my two-year anniversary of borderline episodes getting triggered medically in any capacity, anxiety, depression, all that stuff, suicidal ideations, all of it disappeared about two years ago. And a big part of that, I think, was radically accepting that I'm a human on earth with little to no knowledge and everybody's in the same boat. But we want to pretend for the sake of our sanity that we know what we're doing so people don't panic. But the truth is, is we know just as much as I think our ancestors did in terms of knowing our own humanity being introspective. Why are we still trying to answer the same questions the Greeks were asking about our own humanity and the consciousness? Because we haven't actually come to an objective answer. It's it's very hard. And even when we do, even if you want to talk about flat earthers versus not flat earthers or just like what is true, what is not, we're still struggling to have that conversation. And I think that's normal. That's humanity. We move. We move forward at different paces, right? I was thinking about my grandparents, right? I was thinking about how my grandma and my grandfather were arranged married, right? In Iraq. Um, my grandfather was born 103 years ago. He passed away last year. And my grandma passed away from Alzheimer's and my grandparents are all now past cancer, brain cancer, different things, right? But they all grew up in a time where they found a radio for the first time. And my grandpa thought it was a little man in the box. My grandma was taken from weddings 
um, from Saddam's army would be taken away for three days. Men would hide in the mountains because they were rebels against his army and they would come and berate the women and children finding the husbands. It was really just like a crazy story, right? That I as an American just have never been able to have anything like that happen to me, right? I've just never had anything like that happen to me. Some of us do, some of us don't to some extent. Issues with authorities, issues with discrimination, that the, that those, th- those things happen on a spectrum as well. But I was thinking about their arranged marriage. And I, I've said it in the past before. My grandma was 12, my grandpa was 18, and they were arranged married. Now, you have to remember that at the time they were arranged married, right, and before they had 17 kids, before they died, you know, married and all those things, they were two people living in a village that in a primarily Muslim country where Muslims and Chaldeans did not get married. Chaldeans were Catholic or Greek Orthodox. They were some sort of Christian religious. Well, Islam, you know, was the primary religion. My dad kicked out of school. Um, the story goes two ways. My dad was either kicked out of school at third grade or seventh grade, which I think is probably seventh grade. But he was kicked out of school and he was denied access to education because he was not a Muslim, right? Even though he has a Muslim name, he just he was a Catholic. So I I think when I think about my parents' story, I can't think of it in regards to what we know today. That would be very unfair and very unethical. I have to think about it when they were there at that time. And so I think about my grandparents and I think about how my grandpa wanted to be a priest and my grandma wanted to be a teenager and how they both wanted to do different things, both leading to lives of non-sexual activity, (laughs) which is sort of ironic, but then were forced to get married because Their families knew that if they didn't, not only would they not have sons and carry on the legacy of their like family, but they would probably be left alone, right? Because if my grandma didn't get married, what would she have done as she aged, right? She needed a husband to kind of be there for her, even though my other grandma was a very wealthy and well wealthy by (laughs) different standards of the time, right? Well-known upper class seamstress in Iraq and Baghdad, even though my other grandma lived in the city, my grandma in the country, like that... That wasn't the way they thought about it, right? The, the jobs they had back then were like owning a vineyard, farming, collecting your own resources. It's not like someone went to go work at Tilly's or Hot Topic. So again, we have to remember that they're dealing with a survival to the T experience. In America, in different places of the Middle East, you can have a living experience, right? You can stop surviving and learn to live. I'm in a position where I believe I've stopped surviving and now I've learned to live and I'm experiencing that. And I do recognize that in the future, should I be in another survival moment, it is only a moment in time. So now I really look at my life as moments of time. So that moment of time, where my grandma was married, my grandpa was married, does not justify this current moment of time in which we don't have to do that anymore. And my family knew that and they, like I said, on a spectrum, all came to terms with it differently. So my grandma's generation married between the ages of 12 and 14, my auntie's generation between the ages of like 15 to 18, my mom's generation between the ages of 18 to 21, and then my generation into our 30s, late 20s, 40s, my cousins who are all like very well educated, very interesting. They all got married in their late 30s, um, early 40s, had children all, all themselves, And so it's, you know, we learn on a spectrum. All of humanity does. So again, the levels are about introspection and radical acceptance of what's actually happening. So take it down, right? So we have modern society. Uh, Okay, well, no, we have my aunt, my grandma, okay, their generation, my mom's generation, and then my generation, and all of us are moving like this. So that means if we're all moving like this together, my grandma is still technically behind me and might always be, rest, God rest her soul, she's not alive, but she would always be because it would take so much for her to keep up. I can't even keep up. I'm going to fall behind. I'm falling behind my younger siblings. Like they're much more aware of what the youths are doing than even I am. And then that will continue. Now it doesn't have to continue. I could try to spend all of my life learning about what the youths are doing and try to stay up to date with every eight-year-old in America, right, for the rest of my life. Or no, wait, maybe I should not just do America. What if I do Canada? Wait, what if we do Guam? What if we do Honduras? What if we do... Do you get what I'm saying? We have we can't even say, oh, I'm going to keep track of the trends of the youth because who are the youth? Are they American youth? Are they European youth? Are you arguing that youth isn't different around the world? Like the human experience is generally simply the same, but the nuanced experience of the individual is vastly different. And even, even... You can put a bunch of fucking queer people in the same room who've all had suicidal ideations, maybe all borderline, maybe all even female, and we would all have different experiences with our lives, even though at the very base of our desires is to love and be loved, to see and be seen, right? And so I think, again, what is a bad person, what is a good person is completely predicated on how honest we want to be about the human condition,
Do we want to have open and honest conversations that behind closed doors, ugly fucking shit is going down, including a spectrum of physical abuse or slash physical altercations? Maybe it's not abuse. Maybe it's an altercation. You ever see siblings fight it out? Is that a physical abuse or is that an altercation? Well, it's a spectrum. Maybe you have siblings who do physically abuse you in a really radically and disgusting way. And maybe you have siblings that you sometimes get into fistfights with because that's how you squash beef. And I know a lot of people are, you know, oh, you should never have to do that. Well, yeah, maybe not in a real fist fight. Maybe the fist fights with gloves and we all have guards in our mouth and we can't do anything permanent or send each other to the hospital. Is that is that okay in that context? You know what I'm saying? So if the context predicates the badness, then ultimately all the rules we've created for our humanity are predicated on a, on a moving basis, a growing ethical basis, which means nothing can be objective in that sense. Destiny even said it about words, you know, the N word. What if, you know, the cracker word actually was the one he said, let's say the cracker word as an example. We take it down to the originator. A lot of people think it's the sound of the whip, you know, not quite, but okay. Let's say that is true and it's coming from a place of power. So by calling a white person cracker, you're not insulting them in a slur way the way you could at a black person saying the N word, right? Keep in mind through all these conversations, black people and white people, because you are the prominent view of lens through which we talk about race, you too get the most spotlight and in some ways are privileged because of that. So do not think that as black Americans, you are not also in a privileged position because you most certainly aren't talking about Chaldean rights and Asian people just got their moment in the spotlight. So regardless of how we want to say what's happening, what's clearly happening is white and black people get the focus of the conversation when it comes to race. And I understand why. And at the same time, do you not think that's a fucking problem? So ultimately, we run into the same problem, right? That white and black people, certain groups, get the focus of the conversation, which dulls and stalls the conversation about other people, which it shouldn't even be. We should be talking about as a collective, as a country, as a community, as a city, as a state. How do we want to function as a community? Do we want there to be an open space for people to see the word cracker and get offended, see the word the n-word and get offended, great. Let's talk about where that lies. Let's talk about the spectrum of that interaction. So, okay, Destiny, going back, Destiny says, um, you know, if, if the people in his comments were saying, since it's a place of power, the, the insult cracker, it doesn't count. But what if we go back in history and look at the originator of certain words? What if the n-word did come from a place of power? Would we would white people be able to say it? I mean, they did create it, right? So like, would they be able to say it? It's theirs. So right, and that's a joke uh, Griffey made recently with ABBA where like maybe white people should say the N-word. I mean, they made it. It's a joke, right? Ha, ha, ha. But what's the ounce of truth in it? A good joke always has an ounce of truth in it, right? And again, if black Americans wanted to be accepted by the whites, they would have to be good at capitalism, which means they would have to sell out by allowing white people to say the N-word, dress like them, and do their hair like them. Very frustrating. And again, on an introspection level, obviously human to human, we can see that Ariana Grande is using race baiting to push her capitalistic agenda, which is why she's radically accepted by the masses, because the masses want to be included in the masses in America are currently white people. But by 2050, I think, will primarily be people of color. I mean, I'm a Chaldean woman and I'm most likely going to probably I don't know what I'm going to end up with, to be honest. I don't get hit on by right now. I'm getting mostly hit on by POC people. So I'm curious to see how that goes. But I've in the past mostly dated white people. So it's like it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But either way, I am also contributing to the change of statistics as we should be falling in love organically, creating babies out of that love, making love to make a baby. That baby is like a product of love. And even if that baby is not a product of love, that baby is a symbol of love because that baby's new life. And new life is love, in my opinion. Okay. So when we're having these conversations, remember, we have to decide what is the goal of our introspection. If it's to only see the surface, then on the surface level, nobody should say the N-word but black people. And on the same surface level, anyone who's not, no one should be using the cracker word either except crackers, which I'm not sure who that would be, but it most certainly isn't me. Hassan and Ethan did a whole podcast about this, proving once again that Middle Eastern people are not white because all the insults towards these people are honky and hillbilly and hick, and none of those words apply to my ancestors or my parents or me. So again, we can't even pretend we're white enough to feel insulted by the word cracker, which does not give us the right to say it and tell white people they don't feel offended by it because they might actually feel offended by it, whether or not they should be is predicated on the idea that they have power. So in 2050, let's say all black people have power. Does that mean we now can say the N-word because it's not the same thing? And if that's the case, 
then again, these things are all subjective. They're predicated on time in which they exist and what's happening, which I guess is fine too. Like I'd said it with the consent, you know, reasoning around my grandma's marriage was reasonable for the time, not reasonable now. Maybe that is what it means to explore bad or good. Maybe that is what it means to be a person. Maybe that is what it means to be nuanced. It's to know that it's on a spectrum and it's predicated on the context of the time in which it's, you know, happening. But what is time? Is time a thing that exists overall? Is time on a calendar? Is time in a person's life? Is time predicated on a culture's, um, the time in the culture's life, right? Time is a really weird subject. Time is, we judge time very differently. All of us judge time very differently, right? How was the year 2020? 2021, sorry. How was your 2021? Long year, short year, quick year. I'm going to be real, girl. I blinked and it was done. I am not prepared for 2022, but I'm excited for it. I have a lot of really good projects coming up and everything has been great. Like, honestly, my quarantine was relatively good, minus a couple of things that happened, whether it was deaths or inconvenience with traveling or sick friends. Overall, it was pretty successful. I would even argue that the last two years were good for me, but they weren't good for everyone in my life. Some people really suffered the last two years. Some people really felt the last two years. And even though there were ups and downs, again, the way I judge whether or not life is bad is if I am honestly triggered, (laughs) which sounds kind of crazy, but I judge my life on whether or not I'm fucked up mentally. Because if I'm fucked up mentally, then I'm in a bad place. And I haven't been in a bad place in over two years. And that's really a big deal for somebody who's been in a bad place since she was eight years old. So I just want to give credit to Pat's Brittany because she dealt with 20 years of just badness in a way that I had a really hard time and still always do processing. I mean, you could even argue 30 whole years, but I'm giving her some leeway because things did get better eventually. And they stopped being completely bad all the time. And then they went to bad sometimes and then bad almost never. And then now never, never really. I've all had hard days. I've had difficult days, but I don't consider hard days and bad days the same. Again, my language, not yours. So I'm just letting you, you know, for people who are new, that's, that's how my brain works. You know, I think about my life and the way that I feel it and think it, you know, I gay judge people. I try not to real judge people until I have to. And I hate being put in a position where I have to judge people. So I think about time in respect to how I can judge and understand people, how I can judge and understand myself. Okay, I'll give you an example. Let's say a person is teaching fifth graders and they're an alcoholic, currently, you know, not going to AA, not fixing their problem. They drink, maybe they drink. Let's say they take a shot before work and a and a whole bottle after work. Let's say they're just plastered basically all the time, maybe even a little tipsy throughout the day while they're teaching, but nobody ever finds out. Is that a bad person or a good person? Is that a bad teacher or a good teacher? If they managed to never let anyone find out and they've managed to kind of exist that way, no one knew Does that mean they're reasonable? Does that mean they're an alcoholic even? Does that mean they're functioning? Someone left a comment in my video the other day asking if addicts can be fives. Again, fives, the levels are about levels of introspection. Levels of introspection, right? So that means, let's say a person who's a five, okay, is is a person who radically accepts they know little to nothing and they're doing their best to live out their life with their understood truths. And they have an opportunity to sort of engage in drug use. And that drug gets into their system and they become physically addicted. Maybe it's not even a choice they made. Maybe they went to the hospital and they took some drugs and they had a reaction. That could happen. Or do we want to believe that people choose to get addicted? Maybe. Yes. Do you remember that uh, professor who like did heroin like every morning before work, I think it was, for five years that nobody knew? And now he's talking about it. His study is drugs, to be fair. But... I look at him and I look at his functionality. Is that a drug addict? I actually had a conversation with one of my viewers, Micah, who came on and we talked about what is addiction. And it's very hard because I am not an addict and the addicts in my life were what I would call functioning ones. So they weren't people that I ever thought of as those druggies, right? They were just people who did drugs or alcohol. And then me, myself, I, I love la drugs. I love la drugs so much. I don't love alcohol. I think it tastes bad, but I love weed. I'm high right now. I I love, you know, um, acid. I love DMT. I love, I love drugs. I love them, but I haven't had all kinds of drugs. So what if I was put in a room with just drugs I hated? Would that be good or bad? Well, I think it was bad because I was like, I don't even like these drugs. So now it feels like I'm just in a room with alcohol, which makes me feel bad. So maybe it's a bad situation for me based off of the timing of when I'm 
interacting with it. Because if I was in my 20s and I was put in a room full of alcohol, I'd be like, uh, uh, uh. That was like what I would want to do. But this now, Brittany, and this time, this Brittany, not so much. Alcohol is just like, oh, that's a bummer. It's not fun. Tastes gross. Doesn't make me feel good. I'm hungover the next day. I do not have a 20s body anymore that can just like perk right up, you know, with a drink of water. So again, timing is weird, but I think about that alcoholic teacher. I think about former drinking Britney. I think about Britney now as like a drug user. And I I don't mind any language around it, but I I know it's because I know it's a spectrum. I know it's a fucking spectrum. So there can be teachers who are dealing with alcoholism who are functioning. And there are going to be teachers that impact their students in a negative way and they cannot be teachers. Same with mental illness, right? What if a person is going through a mental illness, maybe they have borderline like I do. And let's say they're getting triggered every day, but they're still going to work. Maybe the kids, maybe one of the kids catches them crying in a closet. Is that okay? Because they have borderline? Well, what if they were an alcoholic who was crying in the closet? Is that gross because they're an alcoholic? Is that bad or good on what? The the location, the timing where they are? Hold on, I gotta tell my brothers to shut the fuck up while they play Smash Bros because I'm pretty sure my mic is picking them up. <sighs> are my brothers bad people because they want to shut the fuck up while I'm recording my podcast? No, they're just excited to hang out with each other. And in this moment of time, they keep forgetting that I'm working up here or that my job is serious, which by the way, I want you to know, <laughs> no one in my family watches my videos. So they all have like preconceived notions of even what I'm doing with my work. Some people think it's bad because it's not Catholicism. Some think people think it's good because it's helping people. It's all a spectrum. Okay, so moments of time, alcohol, teacher, borderline, Closet. Okay, yes. So is, again, moments of time. What is time? Time is now. It's then. It, it's, it's, it's there. It's forward. It's in the future. It's time is everything. And, and, and knowing where you are in that time matters. Like when I'm triggered, I know in this moment of time, I am not myself. So I do not believe alcohol, drugs, or any of those things show your real authentic self. I've, I admitted on my live show the other day that I get high, so I'm nicer to you on the internet. <laughs> my default personality is not calm in the way that I even am now. Like I'm very nice right now. I'm shielded. I'm feeling great. I'm fucking buzzing in my cheeks. I am a much more digestible person stoned. And if I'm not digestible to you now, you should go watch that Richard Pierre live show thing I did because that is sober Britney. And sober Britney is more like anti Britney versus high Britney is more like Mama Simon. I have a patience because in this moment of time, I am high. (laughs) And that's kind of crazy to admit out loud, but it's true. It's true. The world does not want my authentic version. Or at least let me rephrase. The world could never want anyone's authentic version. Because it doesn't make sense that in a singular singular moment of time in which you exist as this person, everyone would be open to receiving that energy or that attitude. Because remember, I have attitude. I know I'm not digestible. I don't want the world to be able to unifiably accept me. And I don't want to be a person that could be widely accepted. Do you remember when the Me Too movement was happening? And I was heavily into Stephen Colbert at the time. I was a total three, um, three, three immersed in the world of like Stephen Colbert you know what I mean you know black people and BLM they know what's up but like no they're also victims to the same full fucking bullshit system that we're all victims to which is ourselves not a system of oppression like puppet masters ourselves the 300 million Americans that could definitely just like not go to work tomorrow and change the whole fucking world nope too hard to stay home tomorrow all at the same time we would rather go to work and keep sucking the dicks of the politicians no judgment just gay judgment. It's fine. Your life is yours, right? We're all on a journey. So during the whole Me Too movement, okay, going back to Stephen Colbert, there was a joke he made that really stayed with me. And it said, oh my God, is every man in Hollywood a pervert? At least Tom Hanks, okay? He's the only one. Not Tom Hanks though. If Tom Hanks becomes Me too we're done. All men are done. And I wanted to be like, hey, Stephen Colbert, you're a man. Why isn't your name the butt of the joke? Because you're not wholesome or believable enough to have not touched a woman? Because Tom Hanks is literally our like internal version of like wholesome, like the ultimate yes, oh my gosh. Why, why, what is the joke? Like the joke was funny in a way that I laughed and then I cringed because I was thinking, oh God, in this moment of time, 
Tom Hanks is basically starring in every movie because there's basically no more actors that haven't been Me Too'd. Even now, the new reboot of Sex and the City came out and Big was Me Too'd. And I'm like, Big! I'm like, oh my God! And it's not that I don't believe it or believe it. It's just that I don't know and I don't know the context of that moment of time in, w- in which people 20 years ago had sex and now they're re- rehashing it. You know what I mean? I don't know. But I do know in my own life, I've done questionable things. There have been questionable moments so how could I ever be a person that could be widely accepted? How could I ever be a Tom Hanks? And is, even, is Tom Hanks even Tom Hanks? You know, it's funny. Andrew Schultz said one thing Tom Hanks gave us during the pandemic is a reassurance that COVID wasn't that bad because Tom Hanks got it and he's old as fuck and he survived. Trump got it. He's old as fuck. He did fine, which reassured a lot of people that see it's not that big of a deal because the number one group we were told to fear for doesn't seem to be dying in the vast numbers that they should. But people on the left would say that's because They have access and money to really good doctors in immediate medicine versus where I live. Mark had to go to the hospital the other night. He wasn't breathing very well because he had a cold and um, he had to go get tested for COVID to double check it wasn't COVID because he works out at Starbucks and he interacts with a lot of people. And though they wear masks and all that stuff, it doesn't matter. So, okay, he went to the hospital and it took six hours to get his test back because we don't have rapid testing out here. I live in a rural little community so we don't have rapid testing and it's who knows how much it's going to cost him I know when I got tested a couple years ago without health insurance I had to be locked in a room and that cost three thousand dollars to get tested for COVID x-rays and be locked in a room so again we're all you know facing different versions of 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 reality and therefore a different time and a different you know everything's got to be different because it is different And I don't like the idea that we're all experiencing the same sort of storyline, even though we are ultimately, because again, introspection, okay? So you have the storyline that's happening at the surface. People are dying from COVID. People can't work, okay? People need vaccines. People don't want to get vaccines. People want to force people to get vaccines. People don't want to, blah, 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 okay? Then below that, we have the actual pharmaceutical system that's happening, you know? People are making billions of dollars off this vaccine. Whether or not COVID is as scary as it, you know, is, I don't know, because I've had swine flu. I've had COVID. I've had a lot of the viruses that came through over the years. I've had chicken pox and all these things because I was older enough that the vaccine wasn't a thing so all these things that ended up and I've been fine the world's been fine everyone functioned the same you know what I mean but for some people that's not true for some people their moment of time is erratic and crazy and death and, and, and insane right so okay so then we're having different layers of introspection based off of that but it's all kind of the same and then you go down a level again and that's like that three level where you say to yourself hold up hold up hold up if there is a system at place if there is big brother the conservatives call it or white supremacist government, the left calls it, if there is a group of people who are elites who are in control of us, as like maybe the libertarians would say, like, hey, we're giving our money to the elites. What are we doing? Where's the Bernie Sanders people or the independents, okay? If you come down to even the level I was at when I was a three, which was like, oh my God, everything we know is basically fabricated storylines. History is a fabrication because we're not sure. If our own family stories... What was Pocahontas' name? What's her name? Pocahontas, Pocahontas, Pocahontas is, uh, what is her name? What is her name? Elizabeth Warren. Sorry, Elizabeth. I could not fucking remember your name. And that's funny because I have a couple of patrons or one in particular who really likes Elizabeth Warren and they always want me to talk about her, but I have nothing to say about her. Obviously, I don't even remember her name. I just know she's a white lady whose family couldn't figure out that she wasn't native, but maybe she is partly, I don't know. But the point is that she grew up thinking her whole life she was. She thought she was. And then people defended her. Other people criticized her because they thought she was lying or being malicious. Like uh, uh, Ollie London, who's obviously knows he's white, right? Like he obviously knows he's not Korean, okay? Or Ayana Grande, who never comes out and says she's a different ethnicity, but obviously uses it for capitalistic gain. So that's why the conservatives think Elizabeth, and that's why people think white people who say they're native are using it for like POC credit. Like, oh, look, I can say things about people of color because I am one. Or some people think I shouldn't say, oops, that I'm a person of color because I'm white passing, whatever that means. Because as <laughs> as if whiteness doesn't exist around the world or brownness doesn't exist around the world. Again, time and place, introspection. Okay, so that's like the three. Like Elizabeth Warren shattered sort of a mini illusion that people could pretend to be things. Rachel Dolezal shattered an illusion that people could pretend to be things and people would believe them. The lady in um, Canada who said she was native, people believed her until they started getting suspicious, right? We want to believe people are good and and aren't going to lie to us about things like that. Like who's going to think that a white lady is going to pretend she's black? Who's going to think that? 
no one until it happens. And then you go, oh, how many other people are pretending to be trans but not knowing they're pretending? How many people are pretending to be bisexual or gay or lesbian or any of these things and they aren't? How many people are pretending to be Catholic or Muslim or any of these things and are not? And whether they're doing it truly because they believe that they are these things but they're really not or maybe they want to pretend they're these things so sort of pretend. I always tell the siblings who don't go to church, you don't believe in your God as much as you say you do. Girl, if I believed in a literal God, I would be on my hands and knees every day. But I'm on my hands and knees for different reasons now. But like, listen to what I'm saying, okay? They tell me they believe in a God, but then don't go to church. It's like, girl, how powerful is your faith, right? In a specific God. It's not like they believe in a agnostic God. They say they believe in the Catholic one. Well, a Catholic one says get your butt to church every Sunday. So some people would say they're bad Catholics, which I would say. And some people would say, oh, they're just lukewarm Catholics. Or, oh, they're they're trying, but they're not really, their heart isn't in it right now. Or my brother, my friend brother would say all of us are Catholic, but we haven't found our way to Christ yet. And it's our job to decide when we're going to do it. Good, bad. What is this idea that we have in our head? What When you imagine a bad or a good person, what do you imagine? You know what I mean? One time... I had a one-on-one call with a person who had been assaulted by a friend, somebody she trusted. And we had to have a really nuanced, again, door-closed conversation about whether or not this was a person who she could have contact with again. Think about that. Could you imagine being assaulted and wanting to have a conversation with that person? I can and I can't. I can imagine it, imagine it <clears throat> if it was someone I knew prior or if the circumstance was very specific. I could not understand it based off of like if that person was basically a stranger to me. Um, and because of that, I have a hard time knowing what I'd really do, but I believe I think I'd know what I'd do, but I can't be sure. And I can't decide if the person who committed the assault is a bad person because of that assault, or are they a bad person because they weren't, they weren't capable of having a conversation after the assault. I can't decide, and I have a hard time around this, right? What makes a person a bad person? Is it their lack of knowing, their lack of introspection? Well, in that case, most people are bad because most people aren't as introspective as they can be. Or is it the fact that they're trying their best and this is where they are, which is kind of means like, like they're a goodish person or a good person because they're trying their best and they're on the spectrum of, of learning themselves, so that middle stage, that three stage is really hard to come to come to, you know, to have a conclusion about because it is layered and you're so aware of it that you're like, what do I do? What do I do? What? It's not simple. As a two, you would know, oh, I'm this. This is what we do. You would have an answer because it's written out for you like a religion. It's a bubble thing. But a three hops between knowing there are other bubbles and other ways to do things and my bubble. So what is that shame I'm feeling in regards to my culture and betraying the culture's expectation of me? Then you go down to like a four who goes, oh my God, fuck all of you. None of this even fucking matters because we're all stupid stardust and all of you think this matters. And it can't. How could Kim Kardashian matter? Who? How could wearing braids matter? How could any of this fucking matter when we're literally just like evolved over time, trying our best. We're a species unknown to do, uh, an, uh, with an unknown origin. We're trying our best to understand where we're here, but no one has the real answer. You know, the other day Jordan Peterson had this Muslim guy on. And he, you know, he says, like, is the world will be Islamic one day because Islam is the right religion. You are an epistemological pragmatist, from my understanding. You, you said before in an interview that anything which serves life is is true. That's what you said, I think, with Sam Harris. If this is the case, and you said it's nested in Darwinism, if this is your position, then the truth of the well, matter... It's nested, it's nested in a very complex manner in Darwinism. Yeah, but if it's I mean, if it's I think nested... that highest truth is something like love. And I think it's very much associated with the notions of love that are central to religious traditions. And so I'm with you, but you still believe that truth is utility and you still believe because that's the pragmatist position. And so truth is relative. And what I'm saying. Yeah, but you, I also believe that the basis of utility is love. That's, so that's I'm not the, so that's sure it. that I'm not so sure that you and I differ so much on that particular. No, but John Peterson, what I want to say to you is this, right? First of all, pragmatically, Islam is doing the best because if you're talking about evolution, then we're talking about reproduction and survivability. And Islam has got the highest uh, birth rates in the world today. It's the fastest growing religion by a mile. By, by 2100, it will be number one. So in your definition, it should be the most true, by the way. Number one. Number two is this. Is that yeah, well? That's a lot of love. All that reproduction. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't try and change the subject now. Look. So number 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 two is this. Look, Doctor Jordan Peterson. Is I'll tell you that I think I've seen your struggle against postmodernism. I've seen your struggle against nihilism, and I don't think you will be successful. And I'm I'm sorry to say it like this. And the reason why I don't think you'll be successful is because 
your framework is itself relativistic. If, if it's utility and epistemologically pragmatic, then truth is relative. And if truth is relative, what are you going to say to a... You, you actually agree with the postmodernists in that sense. You, I think you're closer to postmodernists than you think. In fact, the pragmatist position is not inconsistent. It's a secret love. It's not inconsistent, Jordan Peterson, with the pragmatic position that you hold. And the world will be Muslim. And he can't wait for that world. And I heard that and I was like, fucking kill me now. Take a goddamn sword and ah, no, 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 my head right the fuck off, you bitch. Because I'm not living in that goddamn world. All right? I already escaped one religion. I'm not doing it twice. And if I have to do it twice, because we're all stardust, I'm going to fucking blow my brains out. <sighs> Super dramatic, but very true. The truth is, is that a world that is one religion is so fucking suffocating to me because I know it's so fucking wrong. It is so fucking wrong. You're so fucking retarded for even thinking it's right. And at the same time, I know you have to think it's right because in this moment of time, you are a person who's trying their best and your God has given you freedom and you feel very comfortable in that freedom and you feel good with its regulations and limitations and you think it is the objective answer for everyone and it served you so fucking well that you want everyone to be served just as well. Well, boo-boo, my world is very lovely, serves me very well, and I think you should give it a chance if it serves your joy. If it doesn't serve your joy, stay in your goddamn corner and leave me alone. I know I go after lefts, leftists a lot on my channel in general and people think I'm a conservative. But to be honest, I never talk about religious conservatives as much because when I do, I just remember how fucking shallow their thinking can be. But then I calm back down because then I remember my own family and I think about how much they've grown and I know it's not true. It's hard, right, deciding who's a bad person or a good person. But to me, anytime you want to regulate a person's bodily autonomy – or their right to exist in the, on the planet how they want to with themselves, just their individual selves, no one else, okay? So don't all the perverts be bringing up child rape. I get that all the time, guys. Well, Brittany, you're advocating for people to just be able to sleep with minors. And I'm like, okay, no, because that involves another person. I'm asking, does an individual have the right to exist how they want with their own body when, when not interacting with existence? Because remember, we are individuals existing, and then everything around this cup is existence. Everything around me is existence. Am I, Brittany, allowed to live in my body how I want? Am I allowed to kill myself? Am I allowed to choose my death? Am I allowed to put tattoos on my body? Am I allowed to abort my child? Am I allowed to take a vaccine if I, don't, if I want to, if I don't want to? Am I allowed as an individual to live a life that is about me? Or does that make me a bad person because I'm selfish, I'm a Randian, oh my gosh, I'm narcissistic? Or is there a spectrum? Can you be somebody who is, like I say, I always say I'm selfish and people go, Brittany, you are like not selfish. And I'm like, yes, I am. You just think selfish only looks like the negative way it can, it can turn out. But I think selfish can be positive and healthy. If you choose yourself, your joy, your mental health, your physical health above other people, so you are in a position to help people, that's good selfishness. Even if you're on an island, guys, you're not hurting anyone. If you're a hermit and you never interact with the world, you are not the one person responsible for saving it. But as a collective, literally, as America, as an example, if we just fucking all stopped going to work for the next week, no one pumped their gas, no one ate, you know, everyone lived off what they had. Everyone looked at the government and said, change it, change it. We would fuck up the world economy. We'd fuck up our economy. Things would go horrible. People would starve. There definitely would be fallout. It could, you know, there would be negative things, but it would also make it clear that we have power in a way that we really don't know we have. We have power in numbers, but we can't even agree collectively on what's good or bad, which is why we don't have those numbers as well. We have them, but we don't have them. We have them, but we don't have them. Because if you're not willing to sit across the table from your grandma who maybe is outdated with her non-binary terms because you think she's hateful, then of course we're not going to collectively have the numbers because you're disregarding a human experience as a spectrum of knowing and learning. You are making the privileged assumption you should know better, which is a privileged assumption that people have the right educational tools to know better, the right economical state to get better help, the understanding, maybe they're suffering from, maybe everyone's a little fucking mentally fucked up until we're not. And if you're telling me a lot of people are fucked up right now, then a lot of people don't have the energy to learn and know better. And also, what does that mean to know better? Who gives a fuck if somebody knows if you're non-binary, you fucking bitch? Nobody fucking cares. 
You know what we care about? Whether or not I eat today, whether or not I get to sleep in a bed today, whether or not I am safe today, whether or not I'm going to get assaulted today. Nobody gives a fuck except you because you're selfish. And maybe you should be because for your moment in time, the good and bad is whether or not you feel seen or unseen, which again takes my argument down to the five level to radically fucking accept that we're human beings and we know very little and our experiences are selfish and it is about us. That ultimately we are people on a gender, like a gender um, adventure, a race adventure, an orientation adventure, in my case, a queer adventure. And we are trying to figure out how to be ourselves in a world that is scared of us because we are scared of them and they're scared of us and we're scared of them and we're scared. We have to get to a place where we're not as scared. I live in a conservative town and I'm scared here. I'm not scared here. I'm not scared here. I live in a conservative family. I'm not scared with them. I used to be. I'm not now. I can see them clearly after the borderline stopped in in the sense that it's in remission. After I got better, I started to really recognize like, oh, people are human and humans are good to human and people are beautiful and complex and layered and it's not this fucking simple. And I've never been this simple. You guys have heard me tell my most embarrassing stories. You've heard me say things in the past that I've done and I am ashamed about. But I cannot. It is what it is, girl. Past Brittany did what she did to survive. And it is what it is. And now that I'm not surviving, now that I am in a better place, I do try to be better. I do try not to make those mistakes again. But I'm human and I'm not perfect and I might and therefore I might be a bad person in that moment. But I am not convinced that people are really bad, bad for their whole life. I think they're bad in moments and some moments can last a lifetime. But it's still just a moment. And I really want us to start diving into that in a more introspective way What does it mean to live in moments of time? And what does it mean to be judged in moments of time? I'm not mad that Hassan wants to say cracker. I'm not mad that people want to say the N-word while listening to Rihanna's Needed Me. Because if you think I belt out that song and I don't say every word in the comfort of my home, please, please listen to me. You're living in an illusion, a delusion even, that is so anti-human. I don't know what to do for you. Very frustrating. Except to be the person that you might feel comfortable attacking because I can handle it. But I'm telling you right now, if you think I am crying along to Beyonce's album or Rihanna's album or any of these people's songs and I am not feeling every word, every word in in relation to the context I can relate it to in that moment of time, then you are not seeing me. You're seeing trauma. You're seeing my skin color. You're seeing an idea of me that just doesn't exist. And that's fucking shitty of you. Because I'm a real person. And I would like to connect with other people by recognizing how much we are the same. Because as a five, I think the like down to the introspective level you can get down to, we are all just people. And we're all just trying our best. And all of us are different and unique. And yet, simply speaking, we want to see and be seen. And we want to love and be loved. And that means... Really recognizing when you're observing someone, whether or not it's trauma through a trauma lens or through a healed lens. And if if right now you identify, identify primarily with trauma and you think you always will, you won't. Not if you get better. Not if you work on it. And you might to some degree, but never to the degree of the past self because you will know better. Again, you can criticize your grandmas all you want, but I think you should start with yourselves. Do I have the right state of mind to really know if someone's good or bad? And would I be willing to let someone with this state of mind judge me who doesn't know me? You know what I mean? I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves. Because it's a scary idea thinking about the world just like coming for you. Or the world thinking you're bad because your skin color. Whether you're white or black. All right, guys, I think that's this uh, podcast. Thank you for 2020. Thank you for an amazing year. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy holidays. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having such beautiful and nuanced conversations with me throughout this year. If I make any extra videos throughout the month, which I doubt I will, maybe some little shorts. I hope to see you then. Otherwise, I'll see you in 2021. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Bye. Stuck in my head In real life while I'm bed My belly's being fed And I'm okay I'm just fine Yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind Cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm Sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out
for the truth And living life as a fool Done